Okay, it is it is 7 p.m. We're going to go ahead and get started. I apologize. Let me get those things off my screen. Um, yes, and we are uh, we are recording tonight's webinar. So if there are things that you miss, you'll be able to go back and replay it. Or somebody else that you know wanted to see it, uh, the link will be on the website. throughout the call, just because there are enough of us on here that it just gets to be um, too difficult to try to maintain a conversational style. But I would encourage you to type in qu any questions that you have, and we'll have plenty of time at the end. We should be able to get through all of them. In the event that we don't get to your question, um, you can uh, reach directly out to us. Um, I'm Kurt Galley. I'm the owner of Carriage Houses Northwest and our affiliate Everett A. Um, and you're also going to hear tonight from Amanda Wolf Farmer, who it just waved for those of you who have her on your screen. So I'll be doing the first part of the presentation, kind of setting up the ADU conversation. She'll take you through some of the process and cost slides, and then we'll do the Q&A. So we really appreciate everybody taking the time to be on with us tonight. Um, and we will, like I said, we'll keep it within the hour. This is designed to be what I would call a survey, a very broad overview of the topic of accessory dwelling units. We're going to touch on a bunch of different topics, none of which are, we're going to go into in great detail. But by the time we're done, we'll, we'll have given you what we think are, are all of the big issues that you need to be thinking about if you're considering uh, putting an ADU on your property or whether or not you can put one on your property and what's allowed and what isn't. And again, anything that we don't get answered during this call, we are more than happy to follow up with you um, in, a, in a, a side call. So, so let's get started. I can't tell if that's in people's way or not. Sorry. Okay, so uh, we began this uh, Heritage Houses Northwest in uh, 2016 and what we were originally doing was just building tiny houses on wheels and we still build tiny houses on wheels and I would tell you if you can get away with it it's still the best way to go uh, it's the quickest for us to get to you it's the most cost effective uh, we can build them to look exactly like uh, your home we've got some great models and we're still big fans of tiny houses on wheels and we hope that that legislation keeps coming in the direction of allowing people to use a tiny house on wheels uh, on their property, which is something most jurisdictions are not allowing. And again, we think they should be in, in, uh, concerned about um, design and safety. And if we can meet those two those two requirements, which we can with a tiny house on wheels, then why should it matter whether or not there are it's on a chassis? So different conversation, but we still build them. We're still excited about them. But we began to build ADUs in 2018 as we saw, more people had the ability to put a permanent structure on their property, still wanting a small structure, still wanting to save some money over just building another, you know, full-size home to meet additional housing needs. So we did our, we had our first uh, ADU project in 2018, and we've done them all over the, the Pacific Northwest in uh, Tacoma, Seattle, Shoreline, Linwood in place in uh, unincorporated Snohomish County, we have several. And then we have tiny houses all over the state and into California, tiny houses on wheels. Um, as a builder, we both manufacture homes modularly in, uh, in a factory. And as a general contractor, we can site build. So we're gonna talk a little, we have a slide about that later on, whether or not you want to consider having your ADU built in a factory or site built, the, some of the decisions that go into that, and we can do both of those things. So what are we talking about exactly? Um, there are ADUs that we're gonna be talking about. There are three types that are um, permittable, allowable, that you can get um, um, and, and within the definition are, ADUs that are within the footprint of the home. So you've got a home, you have an unfinished basement, you could turn that unfinished basement into an ADU. All it's got to have is egress to be able to you know, get out. 
and separate entrance exit from the primary home. Then there are attached where you take it, you just do an addition on your home. And again, as long as it's got egress, the ability to get in and out separately from the main house that will meet the definition of an accessory dwelling unit. And then the one that we focus on the most or spend most of our time on are detached accessory dwelling units. And those are backyard cottages. They're structures that are separate from your primary home. They come in all kinds of flavors. There are all kinds of names for them. And if you go down this list, you've probably seen um, some of them or one of these may be your preferred um, name or how you first got introduced to this idea. I personally like Carriage House. It's the name of our, of our company. Um, but all these refer to the same thing, additional living space in an accessory dwelling unit. Um, one question to ask is why are people uh, why is this an interesting topic? Why are you here tonight? Why We've been doing seminars all throughout the fall and have had tons of people show up. We've got a lot of projects going on. Um, and it's because these meet a bunch of different needs. The first and foremost, I think, is to, is to house family members. We've got kids in college. They're going to be moving back to this area at some point, and they've both informed us that they're either going to be living with us or they want us to build something in the backyard so they can afford a place to live. People are building ADUs to generate rental income, and it's a great it's a great use of space. If you've got a large backyard that's underutilized and you have space for it, you can build an ADU and generate rental income. It also because it's permanent property, it increases your property value, and there's no magic to that. You don't necessarily build it, and on day one, you've created value because you're theoretically your your build cost is what it's worth, but as your home does through time, it will appreciate. And it's a wonderful long-term asset to have. Uh, you can use them to create affordable uh, housing for both renters and buyers. <clears throat> One of the reasons that I think the city of Seattle who really led in this area, the development of ADU rules and regulations. One of the things that the city was trying to prevent was people just tearing down big homes and building condo after condo after condo or those the tall skinny condos everywhere and kind of ruining the 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 look and the feel of a of a neighborhood. This is a way to create infill, create potentially substantial infill as more are built without doing that, without tearing up um, neighborhoods. Um, so it's a great alternative to uh, you know raising properties and and rebuilding. And then another huge benefit is just smaller house, less environmental impact. You're using less resources, less waste, less space. Um, and so there's a great uh, environmental impact. I, and I think it, it follows a broader trend where we've seen home sizes consistently go up from, you can go back as far as the 1950s um, through the early 2000s where home sizes just climbed. You know, we went from an average home size of... 900 square feet to over 2,500 square feet. I think you've seen them level out in the last decade. And I think over the next couple of decades, you're going to see even primary home sizes decrease. One is just affordability. People can't afford a 3,500 square foot home on a quarter acre lot. Two, that's not necessarily the, the dream of, of the next generation of homeowners that are coming up. I think more people that are thinking about buying homes from the next generations are living more of their life outside the home. So they have this practical reality. They can't afford to spend $2 million on a home in Seattle or Bellevue or Issaquah um, or Everett or any place around here. And two, that's not the dream. Um, so smaller homes, you're gonna see them both on the primary home and in the proliferation of accessory dwelling units. Now, one of the reasons it's such a hot topic now is there was a house bill that was just passed last summer where the state said, all right, everybody has to get on board with, there were two of them. There was, there was this house bill, house bill 1337 and another one that was house bill 1110 that both addressed uh, creating greater density within what was previously um, called the single family residence zoning. So in any place in the state that's within urban, the uh, urban growth zone, if you've got a, a lot that was a single family residence lot, eligible 
for two accessory dwelling units. It's got a, it, is, it has to be of a certain size because you can only encumber a certain amount of the property and we'll get into that. But nobody can opt out. That's the big thing about this. No city can say, sorry, we're not going to do that. Everybody is going to be, um, is, is, it, it has to come in line with the new rules and regulations. The only place where you'll see a deviation from that is in communities where there are, where there are CCNRs that were already in place. They will be grandfathered in and you can't, you can't overwrite those. But in most locations, um, single family residents, are eligible for not just one, but two accessory dwelling units. So we want to look at those specifically, and we'll use what the city of Everett did, because they largely just um, adopted what the state's minimum requirements are. But I want to give them credit because they did it before they had to. Um, there are some cities and municipalities that are going to wait until uh, what the state rule, if we go back to the last slide, the, the, this ordinance said that within six months, next periodic comprehensive plan, they've got to come into line with what the state has, um, ha, you know, has passed. Everett came in the line before that, and so starting this year, they adopted the new AD rules. And here are some of the here are some of the bullet points um, that are now allowed. Every lot, as I mentioned, can have two ADUs allowed on the lot. Maximum size for a detached accessory dwelling unit is a thousand square feet. That one's important because some places said had previously said that even if you could have an ADU, it could only be up to 50% of the size of the primary home. So if the primary home was a thousand square feet, the ADU couldn't be any larger than 500 square feet. And other places just had arbitrary rules. Um, you know, a town might have said uh, you can have an ADU, but it can't be more than 600 square feet. So now the minimum size is a thousand square feet. Um, ownership segregation is allowed. That just means that you don't have to have you don't the owner doesn't have to own the primary home and the uh, accessory dwelling unit. And in fact, you can take your property and create a condominium uh, uh, organization and have a, a two home condominium um, flat and sell both of those. So that's a big deal. It's a, it, it's a big deal to have that kind of flexibility with uh, your lot and with regard to that second unit. Along with that, owner occupancy is no longer required. So before it was, you can build an ADU, but you the homeowner have to be either in the ADU or in the, in the primary home. That's no longer, you can build an ADU and you can rent out both um, properties if you choose to. So that's one of the new rules. Maximum building heights have been standardized and typically increased from what was allowed before. So if you are in the city of Everett, if you're in a lot that backs up to an alley, you can go 28 feet high, which gives you plenty of room for a good two-story accessory dwelling unit and a, you know, and a, and a pitched roof. Uh, it's 24 feet if you don't back up to an alley. Another important one, there's no minimum lot size required. So before, again, you might have they might have said you can have an ADU, but it, you've got to have a 9,600 square foot lot or larger. Now the rule is just you can't have more than 45% lot coverage. So if you've got a if you've got a lot that's a 4,000 square foot lot with a 1,500, you can put a 500 square foot ADU on it and still be underneath your um, maximum lot coverage. If your lot, which a lot of them do in Everett and other places in Snohomish County, if you back up to uh, an alley, there's no setback from the alley. So like a lot of the garages that you see that go right up to the alley, your your accessory dwelling unit can go right up to the alley. Again, that just helps you make more use of the lot. Your other setbacks are typically five feet from the side property, 20 feet in the front yard from the front street, but no minimum setback from the alley. And then another another way that they're trying to promote accessory dwelling units is by waiving additional parking requirements. If you are within a half mile of a transit stop that has regular service throughout the day, you don't necessarily have to have an additional parking spot. And that's one of the things you need to think about. If you build an ADU, you've got to have room for at least one additional parking spot, unless you're in an urban area where you have or an area where you're within a half a mile of a, of a metro stop. So that's a great benefit. 
Um, something I touched on before that I want to talk about just for a minute, oh, sorry, is factory built versus site built. So as I mentioned, we're some, we're a, a, a company that can both manufacture a home in our factory and transport it and set it on location, or we can site build. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both of those things that I'm just going to go through real quickly. Um, the I would say the, the things that are pro building factory built is when we build in a factory, it's in a consistent temperature co controlled environment. So you can imagine this last week when we've had wind and rain and sleet and, and snow and hail, it's always sunny and 70 degrees in our factory. Um, so it means that, that the materials that are out aren't getting hit by the elements. They're not get freezing and uh, they're not in extreme heat in the summer. They're not getting rained on. Um, and so theoretically, you can have a higher quality product if you can keep all your materials safe and secure like that throughout the build process. You also don't have times where you're just down and out because nobody's coming to work when it's 15 degrees and snowing sideways. Now, the cool thing about it is construction can begin while the site work is being done. So uh, we'll go through the process here, but once you get a permit, for your project, you can typically then site work begins. And then once your site work gets to a certain spot and you've got your, your foundation and then you begin your vertical construction. Well, if we're building the, the, the stick part of the house separately in a factory, we can be doing that while the site work is going on. And then we show up by with transporting it. We show up one day, we set it on the foundation, um, attach it to utilities, and we can be in and out within a matter of a few weeks for that part of the job rather than a few months. Um, so there's just a lot less time with people coming and going on your property. Um, and it can, can potentially shorten up the, the, the cycle. We also, if we do a factory build, we've got a little bit bigger service area. So we'll show you in a little bit where we'll build if we're general, if we're building on site and acting as the general contractor, we typically are only going to go within about 20 miles of our shop in Marysville because it's just practically once we get outside of that it becomes too expensive for us to be doing all that traveling. But if we're building in the factory and we're only spending a few weeks at a further out site, then we can consider it. Uh, uh, some of the downsides, you just, you have less visibility into what's going on. You can come to the factory and take a look when you want to, but you're not getting up in the morning and looking out and say, wow, they got the floor system done. Wow. They got that wall up. Um, so, so there's a, you may feel a little bit less control when you don't see the bill going on right there on your property. Um, there are some additional costs for factory built um, that you don't have uh, on site. The largest being transport and then set. When we put a, you know, 14 foot wide by 40 foot long, 15 foot tall home on the back of a semi truck and take it down the road, You've, there's a lot of uh, costs associated with that. And then once it gets there, typically you got a crane waiting to pick it up off that flatbed and put it on foundation. So those are costs, those are very real costs that aren't made up by necessarily any cost savings. So one of the things I would say is building in the factory is it looks exactly the same as building in the field. It's the same materials. It's a lot of the same people. It's the same uh, equipment. Um, and the only time you get cost savings from that is when you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, which really isn't the case here. So it can be a little more expensive to do the factory built um, with the pickup being the time savings. Um, and then we can't do it if we can't get access. So there are people who have contacted us that really would like us to build something in the factory and bring it out, but there just is no practical way to get a home, a, a pre-built home into their backyard. They got a whole row of trees that they don't want to cut down or their house is too close to the other one. The crane would have to reach too far. There's overhead wires that are in the way. <laughs> so we can make a determination on that um, if it's something you're interested in pretty quickly on whether or not we could build something in the factory and bring it out to you. Another big issue that people face when Uh, cost and the cost is significant. You're building a home. So you're building a home typically smaller than maybe the primary home or the one that you're used to living in, but it has all the same components. It still has, you still have to go through the same design, engineering, plan, submittal, permitting, 
uh, the city or municipality is still going to take uh, mitigation fees like fees for schools and parks and roads. Um, we still have to do foundation utilities connections. So everything's the same. It's just on, we're just building on a smaller scale, but that means it's expensive. It's expensive to do it. And most people need to finance at least a, a portion of their bill. So how are people doing it? The primary way is through a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit. And again, this is a survey. Um, if you've got a good banker, talk to them about it. Where I'm not a, I'm not a, a banker. We don't offer loans. Um, I'm just giving you information that, that we know most people are doing when they build. So the difference between a home equity loan and a home equity line of credit is that the home equity loan is, is at a fixed rate, typically longer term, so lower monthly payments. Um, and uh, home equity line of credit is uh, shorter term, and but a variable, a variable rate. Um, so they each have their benefits, and I would say this is what 80% of people use when they're financing. Um, there's also a cash out refinance, but that re that's refinancing your, your primary home and pulling cash out. When you do that, you are creating a new mortgage. Most people's mortgages are set at a lower rate right now than they want to roll into. Most people are not going to do this if they got a rate that's at three and a half, and the only way to do a cash out refinance is to reset their rate at seven. You're not going to do that. Um, there's another option called a renovation or just a construction loan, um, which is typically uh, short term. The benefit of the renovation or construction loan is that the lender will consider the value of the of the unit you are about to build. So they would look at the value of your home and the value of the of the accessory dwelling unit, and they would lend a portion of that combined value. So if you want an ADU, you need to finance it, but you don't have equity in your home, you may wanna consider a renovation or construction loan. But again, that's one that once it is once it is built and you have a certificate of occupancy, you're gonna to need to refinance that into a more traditional mortgage. I think everybody's hoping that rates will stabilize and maybe even and maybe even uh, you know climb back down a little bit in the next year, but nobody has a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen there. People often ask about you know the finance cost versus rental cost, and so I came up with just a very simple illustration here. I would tell you there should be uh, you know asterisks everywhere that there are a bunch of assumptions that I make in this, but these are very general terms that I think are useful. If you consider to build in a 750 square foot, two bedroom, one bath accessory dwelling unit, and the construction cost on that was $300,000, which would, isn't, you know, that's would probably be a fairly typical price for something that size. And you put $50,000 of your own money and took out a loan of $250,000. Then you've got monthly loan payments, depending on your rate of, if it was a 9% rate, which is pretty typical right now on a new home equity line of credit, maybe just under nine is the average, you're looking at a loan payment of 2,200 to 2,500 a month. If rates, if you did get a HELOC, and so it was a variable rate as rates go down, which people are hoping they will do, at a 7% rate, it drops you know, about $500 a month. So that home equity line of credit is sensitive to you know, changes in, in interest rates. Compare that to monthly rent, rental income that you can get. Now, I just looked at typical Everett apartment rental rates right now, which I would say are, I just use those rates, but they would be lower than I think someone would pay for an accessory dwelling unit where they don't share walls with anybody else. Um, but for something that size, a two bedroom, one bath rates, or rents are going to be somewhere in the 1600 to $2,000 a month. So I wouldn't look at this and say it's a moneymaker necessarily, or that you're cash flowing with this, but your rental income does a ton to pay your loan payment. And the reason that's important is because you built something that's an appreciating asset. So if you can rent your place out and have somebody else basically make you most of your monthly loan payment while your asset is appreciating, in 20 years, you could have your home paid off with an asset that's now worth you know, $600,000 against the original $300,000 that you paid for it. And you didn't even pay that $300,000. Renters did. So there's a, it's a it's a 
it's a great long-term um, investment strategy. So some of the things I want to show you, just a few things before I hand it over to Amanda, projects that we've done. This is a 550 square foot um, uh, cabin that was just dilapidated and we renovated this um, cabin, but it gives you an idea kind of, of a typical, you know, uh, finish level and trim level that, that we might, or that we offer. Um, another one that we did, this one is, was about 300 and just under 400 square feet, I believe. And what was cool about this is it was in the city of Seattle. It was actually in the Seward Park area. And everything except for that little bump out that you see to the left, um, we built that in our factory. We transported it down to Seattle. A crane was waiting, lifted it 80 feet in the air and 130 feet over a neighbor's property and put it down onto sonotubes, which were already, all the site work had been done. It was hooked up within a week. The deck and stairs were built the following week and they were up and running and they, they used this as an Airbnb. Um, they're about a five block walk from Lake Washington. So that was a very cool project. And then, um, and then lastly, in third, one of the reasons I was showing you these three is the first one I would say was just all site built. Second one was factory built that we brought in. This one we flat packed. So we built the sidewalls in three sections each. We built the roof in six sections. We built the floor in three sections. And, and we brought this out and stood it up and had, we went from no house there to something that resembled a house within a few days. And then most of our work was just finishing out the interior work, some of the siding marriage lines and the roof. Um, and this is a 200 square foot uh, Airbnb out on Bainbridge Island. So three different, you know, kind of build techniques, three different sizes, just to get you thinking about the types of things that, that we can do and that you may want to consider doing. So with that, I believe the next slide is for Amanda and I'm gonna give her control of the slides. And Hello, Amanda, everyone. take it away. My name is Amanda and I will be your point of contact. If you call our phone number, if you reach out through the contact form on our our website, be the one helping you out. Uh, and I'm going to kind of go through the different steps when um, in, when looking into uh, what it's going to take to have an accessory dwelling unit on your property. So step one is the best thing to do is to fill out the contact form on our website. There is a, a list of questions there, such as size, timing, your, your address, things like that. Um, and if you can fill that out, comes right to me. And that gives me a chance to actually do a web-based site evaluation for you. We do that uh, for the property owners at no charge. And I'm able to pull up your property and uh, do a little bit of research and find your setbacks, your maximum lot coverage, things of that nature. And depending on how thorough that uh, form is, if you let me know what size you're looking for, I can kind of plug in right on that site, um, that site plan, the best spot for placement for that accessory dwelling unit. I'm also able to look up different topography lines. So if you've got a heavily sloped lot, I can see that right from my office. And maybe you had thought that you would like a placement in a certain corner, but because I can see those topography lines, I can let you know that maybe a more affordable placement might be in a different location. Um, and then I'm, I'm also able to give you a, a, a rough price range based on the size accessory dwelling unit that you're looking for. And so you'll then have the tools to, to know, is this project yet feasible? Are you able to get the size you'd like to get? Is it within your, your budget? And if you've decided yes, yes, and yes, then the next steps would be for us to come out and uh, do a site visit. Um, and then from there, I'll kind of break down uh, the next steps. And some of them are kind of moving targets. And so um, if you have specific questions regarding your actual property, again, the best thing to do would be to fill out that contact form. And then I can just speak with you about your exact property and get you those answers that you need. It might be kind of hard to get into site specific 
So um, after that site visit, and we've determined we're on the same page with budget, uh, then we would have a meeting to determine some parameters in the design, you know, narrow down timeframes, things like that. And then we would put you into the design process. So in order to do a full feasibility to, to say, to get, you know, absolute assurance that you can have the exact size, height, width, uh, accessory dwelling unit that you're looking for, uh, we need to be able to, to know the exact design. Uh, once we come up with that design, you would then have to have that accessory dwelling unit engineered for your site specific. So let's say some of that factory built housing that Kurt mentioned, um, we might have done a design in the past that you love and you want to just do it again, we would still need to do site specific engineering for that unit for your property. Um, and then we would, oh, um, timing, timing wise, this is probably about a um, four to six weeks for, for design and, and engineering can be in maybe another four weeks or so. Um, and then you would get that first look at your design. We can kind of nail down, is that still within budget? Do you want to see some upgrades and so on and so forth? And once we've finalized that design, that is when we're able to go into permitting. Permitting can take um, uh, about three to five months. We have an, a slide, I think, coming up with the uh, timelines on that. And, um, and then the plans are submitted to the city. And we do manage the entire process from the site work, utilities, connections, um, and everything. Moving on. Here we go. Sorry. <laughs> the timeline of these different steps. And I'll also mention when uh, different levels of, of deposit might be needed or funds would be needed. So again, the initial site evaluation, there's there's no charge for that. And we don't charge for a, a simple site visit. The more in-depth feasibility, um, that will kind of be in combination with design. And, and once you're ready to move forward with a design, that's when we would uh, need a deposit to get going on that. And, um, and then, Again, when the design is completed, that's when you would um, be looking at another deposit to uh, get that project going in permitting um, and then further on in the build process. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention as we're kind of looking at these different benchmarks for timelines is that this is a best case scenario, right? So this is if everyone makes decisions quickly, every subcontractor shows up on time, no one gets sick, the weather is great, the um, the permitting process goes, is, you know, exactly on time with what's expected. So just keep in mind that there are some things that, that could delay this total seven to 12 month timeline. Um, and some of the things that, um, that could um, delay are especially things like um, if you have wetlands or critical areas. Those um, site specific needs would have to pull in experts to do critical area studies and things like that. Um, if you are on septic, we would have to have a septic design done. And so there's some time involved with those added steps and also some added costs. Here is a, a rough price on what a 500 square foot accessory dwelling unit might cost. So these prices here are, are based on a um, about one step above a builder grade type finish, right? So you're getting high quality LVP water flue flooring, um, you, uh, white vinyl window package, an, an LP or lap or you know, board and batten type of siding. So good quality home. And, um, um, but we also can do, you know, upgrades or higher level of finishes, of course. And so you can kind of see here, so feasibility would be roughly 1,000 to 1,500, design, drafting, and engineering, 
uh, roughly 8,000 to 15,000, plan submittal and permitting, about 2,500 to 3,000, city impact fees. This area can range, of course, depending on the cities, it might be higher or lower in some areas. Site work um, would be roughly 15,000 to 30,000, and then foundation and construction for a total of around 209,000 to 252,000. Again, if you are on a property that is septic, there would be added costs for septic systems, septic design um, that would be reflected in this. <laughs> um, Kurt mentioned earlier our, you know, our factory built housing versus site built. So um, these cities that you see here in this kind of map range that you see here, this is everywhere that we would be happy to come out and do a, a site built project for you. Um, but if you're without, if you're outside of this area, we're also happy to evaluate if your property would be a good fit for uh, modular construction, which, as he mentioned, it's a lot easier when we're not spending um, large amounts of time on site several hours from the factory. And now we are at the question stage of our presentation. We can start at the top here, and uh, I know my internet has some issues, so if I am breaking up, maybe, Kurt, you might want to just pull up the chat. Uh, if you can hear me okay, I can feed you the, the questions from the chat. Um, first one is, uh, uh, thank you, Michelle. I want to put a tiny house on my daughter's property in Arlington, Washington. I want to know if there is a benefit to have it in my daughter. That's like a legal question. <laughs> Um, I was trying to find it, didn't. So would you just repeat that again, please? Yes, this is Michelle, who's moving from Philly to Arlington, uh, and she wants to put a tiny house on her daughter's property in Arlington. I want to know if there was any benefit to having it in her daughter's name versus her name. Oh, um, the permitting will need to be done in the, in the homeowner's name, right? So the, whoever is the legal owner of the property will be who that, the permit. Oh, I goes think she's to. talking about a tiny house on wheels. Aha. Uh -huh. No, there would, there's no, there's no legal or economic benefit to, to that, unless you're talking about what happens when it comes time to sell and even then it's a it's a product that's sold with a sales tax, not a capital gains tax. So no, there's no 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 benefit there. Okay. And uh, Michelle, you can also take that offline and and get into more detail with Amanda. Um, next question. Questions. Uh, next question. Thanks, uh, Marilyn. Do you do garage ADU remodels? I was told by the county that this is the only uh, way that I can do an ADU. So it's kind of two two issues, but maybe you could address the first part. Yeah. The part. So I <laughs> can't speak to whether or not you're, you'd are you be allowed to do something else. Although once we took a look at the property, we'd be able to tell you whether or not that's a that's still a true statement. That may have been a true statement at one point. And then, yes, we do. So um, the difficulty with, uh, I think a lot of times people may think, and I'm not saying this is the case, you know, here that, it would be a more a less expensive way to do to build an accessory dwelling in it. It might be, but that garage, we've got to check it for engineering and it may need to have everything from the foundation that's below it beefed up to the beams that support it. Um, so it's possible, especially if it's a newer garage built on a newer slab foundation, that it's well suited for um, for converting it. So people will either sometimes use the garage itself and convert that to a space or they'll tear off the roof and go up. And in either case, if it was designed as a garage and engineered as a garage, it won't necessarily meet code to be changed to a, a habitable space. But we can always determine what it would take and what that would cost. And, and we're happy to look at that. And just a 
we had a conversation with Marilyn. Uh, 30 seconds, Marilyn. Basically, it's because of the, the size of your lot and your setbacks. So it's not that you're you're not only allowed to have it there. It's just based on the available size of your lot and and where an ADU would fit. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, are ADUs allowed in unincorporated Snohomish County? Do you want me to they take are. that one? Yep, go ahead. Uh, so, like Kurt said, they are. However, <laughs> there's a new ruling that came down that if you are in R5 zoning, and which is typically five acres, right? If your um, R5 lot is um, non-conforming, non um, then which means not five acres, which technically I think it's actually like 4.6 acres, not five. Don't ask me why, it's weird. But basically if you have a two and a half acre lot and you're R5, they actually will not allow a detached accessory dwelling unit. Now, there could be an above garage, you know, conversion type situation, but as far as a detached unit, that's a new ruling that they just passed. And that's one of the locations where you can, where they allow greater than a thousand square feet, I believe it's 1200 square feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to uh, have, Kurt, you take this offline, the next question. So we're going to pass on that one. Uh, sorry about that, City of Sultan. <laughs> but um, we'll let you talk to Kurt uh, afterwards or, or something. Uh, I'll have him reach out to you. Um, next question, where is the factory located? In Marysville, you probably already heard that answered. Uh, next question, how much room do you need between my house and the neighbor's house to bring in your equipment or, or home building supplies for on-site and factory built? Great question. So for factory built, we've we we got it. Um, if it's being rolled in, which we've done in um, certain situations, it's got to be at least a couple feet bigger than the than the width of the house that we're rolling in. So if it's 14 feet wide, we're going to need at least you know 16, 18, 20 feet without having to make any turns. Um, if we can, if we can lift the house. Uh, sometimes we can get around those pinch points. We've had times where also we've taken down um, we've taken down fences and gates. Those are easy to take down and put back up. It's tough to move somebody's house though. So um, we can help you figure those things out. And similarly with having a crew in there, um, if you know the you've got to do you've got to do some excavation and and dirt work. So those machines, you know, we we may have to get a machine in there that has to at least be able to pass through a six foot um area with the tracks but um a, a machine like that's about the biggest one that we need to you know go back in the space so um we can get into some pretty tight some pretty tight locations and have and happy to evaluate okay great uh, next question uh what what mine on wheels uh so i can move it would it, that be considered an rv when it, it's insured, also would that raise my daughter's taxes? So that's the great thing about a tiny house on wheels. It is not, it is not, doesn't become part of permanent property. The downside is most municipalities will not allow you to have somebody live full-time in, in an RV. And in answer to your question, yes, a tiny house on wheels is one of two things. It's either, it's either a, a recreational vehicle or a park model. If it's eight and a half feet or narrower, uh, it's typically classified as a, an RV. And if it's over eight and a half feet and still under 400 square feet, it's a park model. Either way, it's a vehicle. So if you got the, we, we have a lot of customers who have RV connections on their property and they can roll a tiny house in and, and hook up and be ready to go. Um, and I would tell you that we have a lot of customers that are doing it and using their tiny house on wheels that way. But um, you are subject to, if a neighbor calls the city or the county and says, I think they've got somebody living in their tiny house full time, they, the, you may get a call from the city saying, you cannot do that. Nobody can prevent you from keeping your your a tiny house on wheels on your property, but they're- As long as it's certified. As long as it's certified and ours are. So we we, we work through the Washington State Labor and Industries Factory Assembled Structures group 
And that's who certifies our tiny houses on wheels, as well as our factory built um, uh, modular homes. Um, so no rules against having it. There typically are rules against living on it full time. And the people that we know that are doing it are just doing it and don't have an issue with their neighbors. Does not increase your property taxes. Okay, great. Uh, do you have a resource that will do all the permitting, uh, general contractor hiring, et cetera? Yeah. So one of the things, so Amanda maybe touched on this a little bit, but sometimes we will outsource or we'll work with a partner for the first part of the process. So we're really good builders. That's the part that we really stand behind. We can design, we can help you through the permit process, but there are other companies that in many cases just do a better job uh, than that. And a lot of architectural um, companies, design companies are already used to creating a site plan, uh, the ADU layout, pulling together plan sets and doing plan submittals to the county. So there are times where, where we may say, hey, you're gonna work with this other firm. We'll stay involved through the whole process, but you're gonna work with them from initial uh, concept through permit. And then at permit, we will take over and act as a act as your factory builder and or general contractor to coordinate and do all of your site work and your vertical construction. But we'll always be involved you know, with the process. We'll always be working with the design um, uh, company, the company that's pulling your permits, um, even if we're not the ones doing it. Um, so we're, we're involved every step of the way there, but sometimes we just can find people who are, have, uh, you know, greater, uh, availability. If you've got a job you need to get done and we've got a two month wait, sometimes we can, we can get another company who can get started right away. A couple questions, uh, came in just maybe Amanda, if you want to give some clarification around, uh, the site and, uh, analysis and, and, uh, you know, potential visit, the costs associated with those. The initial web-based virtual evaluation to look up your property, there's no charge. To come out and do a site visit where you get to meet us, where we get to actually see your property live, um, there's no cost with that. For instance, um, there are a lot of times where I'm doing a site lookup that maybe is heavily treed. And so it's tough for me to see like, well, actually I can't tell where the best spot for that ADU might be. So we really do need to come out and do a site visit to, to lay eyes on things. Um, when it comes to To the, the step of, of really digging in or having pre-applications with the, the city or to be able to get you a hard firm cost on your project, that's where we would need to start taking it a project to move that, that project forward. Okay, great. Um, another question, have you come across any trouble with the Sonotube Foundation and getting permits or with buyers being able to get the construction loan and refi? Um, no, we, we use, um, and just to talk about foundations for a, a second, we have the, the one that I showed you was, uh, using sonotubes. You have to get down to bearing soil. And as long as you do that, um, uh, the sonotubes are an engineered foundation system. So you're still going to have an engineer involved who's going to determine how many you need, how deep they need to go and the circumference of each song. On a tube, but if they're set properly and the and have the correct saddles on them, they're they are uh, great ways of securing an ADU because there's less excavation, potentially less cost, less time digging trenches um, in the property. We also have used a system called diamond piers, and they're kind of like the old post and pier that you might have built a garage or a shed on, where you're just setting your your um, your beams and posts on on cement blocks. But these blocks, again, are engineered um, and they, they're they called diamond piers because they are in the shape of a diamond and they've got holes that go at different angles and you drive uh, uh, steel pen piles down through them until you hit bearing soil. And that's an engineered system. And theoretically, a municipality cannot say no to uh, an accepted system that comes with the proper engineering. So we've worked through those. We've done slab on grade foundations. We do stem wall, traditional stem wall and footing foundations, uh, diamond piers, uh, and 
sonotubes. So as long as it's as long as you've got an engineer who has designed it and stands behind it, uh, uh, there are a lot of creative ways you can uh, build a foundation. Uh, Rick, I've got the next couple. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, so, uh, Michelle, you asked if on wheels, does the process go quicker? Absolutely. So, for instance, our 26-foot Yucatan model, um, we can build that model in a month and a half to three months, unless there's like large changes of the design. We can move very quickly. Um, some of our larger tiny homes might be, you know, four or five months if they have had a, a lot of changes or customizations. One of some of our smallest tiny homes we could build in six weeks. So yes, very fast. Um, and then uh, City of Sultan, you said, can you purchase by outright a complete carriage home on wheels and take it without going through the permitting process to place it on property under the idea someone is not sure where they want it yet. Also, these are built using IRC and can they be placed outside Washington State? The short answer to that. So like Kurt mentioned earlier, um, we have and a half foot and we've got a park model designation. Either way, they're a vehicle. So if you, a homeowner, want to purchase an RV, a vehicle, and place it on your property, and because you might sell your home and you want to take that with you, yeah, it's a vehicle. It's easiest to literally think of these tiny homes on wheels like you're buying an RV, like you're going to Paulsville RV and buying an RV. And that'll help answer a lot of questions in terms of hookups, you know, placement, how it's used, legally how you can use it, things like that. Um, and no, they are not built to IRC. Um, there is a specific code de designation for tiny homes on meals built to IRC. It's very complicated. We at this time aren't doing it. Um, we build tiny homes that are um, certified by LNI as an RV or park model RV. Now, we did have one park model in the city of Linwood that we were able to get permitted and placed on a Diamond Pier foundation system. That client did a lot of their own legwork, a lot of meetings with the city. And there are some cities like Port Townsend, Port Angeles, and down in Lewis County that are allowed um, to be permitted. Um, and most of the time anchored or tied down on some sort of a foundation system. So. I see a lot of cities as we are trying to attack this affordable housing need going that direction. Right now in our greater Seattle area, it's a gray area. Let me just, I wanna just add um, something to your your conversation about, um, about tiny houses on wheels being RVs. That's true. Legally, they're the same as an RV. Practically, they're, even though in the last couple of years, RV prices have been just astronomically high. When you drive them off the lot, they drop 20%. And over the course of the next 10 years, they're going to drop another 50 to 70%. They differ from a... Uh, from the international residential code which your home is built to is the thickness of the walls and the amount of insulation that they have but same roof system same framing um system and they're going to hold up for decades when we've had situations where people have resold their care carriage houses tiny home in every case that i'm aware of they sold it for more than they bought it from us for so that's a it's a big difference it's a home that's going to last you for decades if you if you treat it well That's it. I mean, any other questions we got here? Yes, um, uh, I can read it off, uh, Rick. I've got it right in front of me. So um, we live in one acre in Machias, Snohomish. It sounds like we could potentially build two uh, ADUs up to a thousand square foot each if we build a thousand square foot ADU on our property. Taxes and homeowners insurance go up roughly. No idea. Um, and I'm not sure that you could do two if you are on um, one acre and it's zoned R5 and you're an unincorporated, not in that urban growth zone like we talked earlier, where all of these ADUs are allowed is in, is in urban growth zones, so higher population cities. 
Um, I would really love it if you could just uh, fill out that contact form and I can get you an exact answer on that. But in terms of property taxes and homeowners insurance, you'd have to reach out to um, those agencies to answer that question. Um, does site work include plumbing and utilities with the city? Um, generally, in the general statement and the list you saw, yes. But again, I'm happy to give you a, a quote based on your exact needs and ADU size so you can know kind of what that amount is for you. Uh, Nicole said, sorry, I'm just going through these some quick guys. Uh, I'm a licensed electrician looking to build a tiny home with a company exactly like carriage homes. What do you look for as someone keen in the, to build and grow in the industry? So we are a factory. Um, and so um, the thing with Washington State and tiny homes is that um, they require a very um, specific process. So we have to have all of our plans submitted to LNI for approval before we can build. And all of the work has to take place in our factory um, by us or by subcontractors hired by us in order for you to have a legal certified tiny home. So I'd love to talk to you further. We might be hiring, uh, but um, but in terms of, of being able to partner, uh, Washington State wouldn't consider that a certified tiny home to do it that way. No, my interest is, is more to build tiny homes for work purposes, for living purposes. So I become, because I'm very passionate about eventually building my own tiny homes. And yeah. So yeah. you would have to become a factory. You'd have to actually get certified with labor and industries and become a carriage houses. Yeah. Cool. I like that. Yeah. Um, Wait. Kim says, how do you insulate any trouble with freezing? Um, all of our accessory dwelling units, um, meet, uh, whatever standards are for your site specific. So if you've got a home, in a in an area in a zone that has a higher snow load or needs a higher level of insulation we meet those site specific needs that are determined through the engineering process can you want to add even, even our tiny houses on wheels a, a, you know typical a typical insulation envelope on a on a recreational vehicle is is r6 insulation and our we do we use spray foam insulation in the in the in the roofs and in the floor cavities, bad insulation in the walls um, with, you know, R15 in the walls and up to R21 in the, in the ceiling and the floor. So we, and, and I can tell you, you can heat most of our tiny houses with a candle um, and a couple of people standing in there. They're really efficient. Um, I'm sorry if I butcher your name. I think it's the Lori. Um, so your question is, I have a raw land zoned R5 that is five acres in an incorporated Snohomish County that I'd like to have a tiny home built first, then build a, pri a primary home afterwards. Is that allowed? Great question. And sort of curious, you actually are allowed to live in an RV while your home is being built. So this is one of those really rare instances where um, it, it's possible to actually maybe get some additional infrastructure on the property that you wouldn't necessarily need to be able to do after the fact. So you can maybe get that additional, you know, sewer septic hookup in place because of, um, uh, because of this. Now, there is some time limit on per too much, but let's say the permit's good for three years. That's the allowed, allotted time you'd be allowed to live in that RV while you're building your house. When the permit is up, you would have to resubmit a new permit in order to keep kind of doing it that way. Um, hey, Amanda, uh, why yeah. don't you advance the slide to the last slide? And in case anybody has to depart as we're approaching the top oh, of the hour. Oh, yes. Great. And then we can just finish up with any last few questions. Um, Kurt, maybe you can advance it. I don't the thing is gone on my page. It's done. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's the slide. Yes. Uh, so if you want to um, scan this QR code, it takes it right to that contact form that I mentioned earlier. Um, you're also welcome to call or email us. Um, and we do ask that if you want to come in for a tour to please make an appointment so we can make sure we are here. The other thing I want to say quickly before we hop off the call, and we do need to do that at the hour, if we did not get to your question, I apologize, but Amanda is, is 
she never stops working. You can call her at Sunday night at, at 10 p.m. She'll she'll answer. So I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but we also have Marco Jakanovic is our head of construction on this call. He's the guy that actually knows how to do this stuff. Um, and and he was not scheduled to speak. But Marco, having listened to us for the last hour, is there anything that we missed that you think is important for people to know before we drop off here? Or did we get it all? You guys did a great job, very thorough, and uh, a lot of great questions coming through that you guys answered well also. So I don't see anything. Our, our We don't build our, regarding the um, International Building Code, uh, in one of the questions, we build to an ANSI code um, and for similar. So there's some different standards that we build to for the tiny houses on wheels and the park models on wheels. Other than that, all of our offsite stuff would be built to IBC IR, or IRC. So no, great job. Thank you, sir. There was a question about the video that the this has been recorded and it will be uploaded to the website uh, in the coming days. So check back next week if you want to take another look or, or send a link to someone else. Excellent. Well, I... Um, I think that's it. We'll wrap up. We're at eight o'clock. I really appreciate everybody joining us. If this has spurred more questions for you, reach out to us. Um, uh, we'd love to be helpful however we can, even if we're not the who you end up uh, going with or you end up not pursuing. So thanks again. And at this time, we'll conclude the call. Thank you, everyone. Sounds great. Thanks, everybody.